Hello everyone, back in front of the computer, I managed to pry myself away from a new Ozark series in my dogs in bed. <laughs> um, before we start, I uh, thought I'd better explain what I did to my forehead. I, uh, I've been living in my house for 17 years, I thought I was marching uh, to the toilet in the right direction and uh, walked straight into a door frame, but I told my wife that I'd tell you all after 13 days of isolation, she's hit me with a pot, okay? So she hit me with a pot. So um, questions, answers, I've got one here that I genuinely believe is going to be valuable to anyone that rides on circuit or teaches on circuit. And that is, um, it's a couple of sayings that it's taken me years of teaching on track to put, scale them right down and put them in to simple, easy to remember phrases. So before I start with the entry phrase, which is what I want to talk to you about, I want to um, talk to you about the exit phrase because they relate. They're the same sort of rule. And then you better remember the two together. And that is <clears throat> most people know that, you know, that ride a big bike on track, um, that opening earlier doesn't make you go faster like it does on a small bike opening earlier makes you go higher okay I learned that the hard way riding on track when I first got on superbike seven high sides in three and a half months you know because I was so determined to go faster hungry and didn't know this rule you know I wish someone had told me and because um on a small bike, on exit, you can open early because you've got no horsepower and you go, ee, 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 build up, you know, that was a 50, um, two stroke. And, uh, but on a big bike, you know, unleashing that power on the edge grip of the rear, it's so dangerous, you know, it just comes around and poof. so you use that edge grip to keep it turning and don't pull the trigger until you've got it aimed in the right direction, you know. So think of it like that, on the exit, big bike, don't pull the trigger till you've got it aimed in the right direction. When I say right direction, it's still, can, once you can get it, you can see the exit thing and you can be at half lean to drive off the turn. Um, the reason I told you that is I've got a saying uh, for the entry as well, and it relates. It's basically the same thing. So, and a lot of people tell me the opposite, you know, that they do. Um, I've heard teachers say the opposite as well, meaning they say they break. You know, so they get the end of the, end of the straight or the short straight or whatever it is, brake, release the brake and turn the bike in, which I think's nuts because basically you're saying you lose, you let go of control of the motorcycle before you even know that you're going to get it aimed in the right direction. There's no way you can go fast like that, no way. So all riders on track that go fast do this, they brake, then because they've got so much contact patch, front tyres pushed into the road uh, by that weight of braking, then you can put some effort into the bars to get it to turn, counter steer, whatever you want to call it, push on the inside bar, pull on the outside, get the thing half lean braking towards the corner, and people that ride fast on track always brake toward the corner, so once you've got it you're braking towards the corner, it's half lean, track specific tyres, that's as much grip as even in a straight line, as half lean, it's fine. Braking towards the corner, then you've still got control of the motorcycle, so it means you can go in much faster, because you know you can keep control of the bike all the way, almost to the corner, you know, you can brake all the way in there. So you're more confident to be going faster, got more control of the bike, The only you've done most of the work, which is getting the bike aimed and on the right line towards the corner, then all you've got to do is decide when is the right moment, meaning speed, to release that brake. Or if you're at a little bit better level, level release that brake smoothly and lean in at the same time, you know, so there's a little bit of trail braking in there as well. Um, then, then obviously the next step will be deciding when to first pick up that throttle, the initial crack, which is really smooth to keep it turning so don't release control of the motorcycle till you've got it aimed in the right direction
Next up, I've got a question from Kai Watson um, about the brakes, the calipers. Um, he's mentioning what are the difference between the Brembos and Tokiko Nissan calipers that come on the stock bikes. Um, I would like to start by saying, unless you've spent crazy money for your bike, you know, like it's a, um, you know what I'm saying, a, a very special motorcycle that costs a lot of money, it won't matter the brand of caliper that's on there, you know, Nissan, Tokiko, Brembo all make good stuff for street bikes and that's what will be on there and the, the difference in quality won't be big. I've owned bikes for my track days with all of those on, they didn't vary very much at all. Um, because again they like we mentioned the other day about shocks these calipers are built to a price they're not going to put on thousands of dollars euros worth of calipers on a street bike because it pushes that price of that bike through the roof so they're, they're street calipers you know maybe track day street track day calipers um and i'll tell you what happens and what the difference is um just to run run through, I'm always trying to improve the brakes on my bike because it's a street bike. Sometimes I've got to ride it fast with fast clients that have real bikes. And uh, <laughs> sometimes it's not fun, you know, because uh, lever all over the place, brake fade, uh, a few other things that I'd like to warn you what happens step by step, what you need to replace. So basically, the faster you go, the more money you've got to spend on your bike, which is a drag, you know, right down to brakes, fuel, tyres, uh, servicing, uh, suspension, everything, the faster you go. And that's why I don't bother building a real bike because most of the time I don't need it and it just costs crazy money for me to use as a work tool to spend all the money on for the few clients I have. So I try to make my stock bike do the job and this is how I do it bit by bit. Um... I have to add things. So first thing I notice is um, if the pads are all right, some of the stock pads are pretty good, um, some aren't. You know, and there's some terrible replacement ones out there that seem to cause more heat and don't slow the bike down. It glazes the discs up. Um, but if I buy um, or are sponsored by the top of the line pads, the race ones, you know, I've used EBC up until recent years, they're top of the line one, track specific now I'm using the SBS, which are top of the line, track specific ones. They're they're pretty good, you know. Like, um, and they're half the money is the Brembo top of the line, track specific ones. So, and uh, not far off until you get to a certain level. They're they're um all you need, you know, all I need. So I'll put those pads in. I've still got the stock discs on, which are Brembo discs that come on the Suzuki. Um, the stock calipers. The first thing um, I will replace will be the master cylinder, you know, because again, it's built to a price, the one that comes on there. It's not as good as the Brembo race ones, you know, you can get. Um, the thing is, you've got a, and people have asked, uh, you've got a bunch of choices on the Brembo master cylinder, uh, if you go Brembo, and I don't bother paying the extra for the all adjustable one. I just get the stock Brembo not adjustable race pump uh, master cylinder because um, my bike is not singing all dancing. All I need is a good ca uh, good master cylinder that um, works well, you know. So I just go for their uh, stock size and not adjustable. Um, when I say not adjustable, the ratio is not adjustable. The leverage, the lever position is but not um, the leverage so anyway um, put that on and at the same time I'll normally do lines because the bike comes with uh, what do you call it ABS and I want rid of that because the ABS lines go all through pumps and like because it's so much more fluid and pumps and stuff uh, sorry lines and stuff um, you get a lot more lever movement because obviously the more fluid and lines the more you can compress that so you get a spongier lever feel. So I put a the Brembo pump on, a master cylinder, run lines straight to the calipers, and to save ripping off all of that uh, ABS um, and electronics and lines and that, we just blank off the ABS um, where it comes out from under the fuel tank, you know. It doesn't even have to take the tank off. We just put caps on there, 
the bike thinks it's got ABS. That's what I do because it's easy to put back as a, a street bike if someone wants it as a street bike afterwards when we sell it. So first of all, pump, obviously fluid, um, and then uh, I, I don't use um, crazy expensive fluid, just good one, you know, like a proper race one. Um, then lines that go directly to the calipers, good pads, stand discs, that's what I've been doing recently. That gets you to quite a good level track day, like fast group, track day, no prop. Thing is, when you get top of that fast group, when you've got, you know, like a good level club or national races or, and I have to ride with them, then my brakes don't handle it, you know. Um, and I'll tell you why. What happens, I notice, is obviously you get lever movement. You know, they'll do maybe four laps hard and then the lever starts all over the place, you know, coming in, coming in. It's inconsistent. I'll grab it and it's like a centimetre or even two centimetres and further than it was the corner before. It starts getting scary. And the, the brake power's still there. It faded a little bit, but it's lever movement that's mainly scary. And together with that lever movement... I think the discs are getting so hot they start dishing, you know. Um, but I think it's because the calipers drag, you know. And the really expensive race ones don't do this. The calipers start dragging on the discs, which causes more heat. Um, I think the pistons are swelling up there. The seals don't handle the heat. Something those pistons don't run free anymore. You notice it when you come in, put your bike on the stand, go to put the warmer on, and the wheel doesn't want to turn. It's dragging. And another thing, so every it's catch-22, you know, the brake's getting hot. Now they start dragging. Because they're dragging, they get even hotter, and they it's just, the brakes are trashed. Another thing that's dangerous when you get to that level is that the standard brakes, because they're dragging, if you come off a first-gear corner, and uh, with the shifters now, it's so easy to keep that front wheel off the ground, just hovering for a long way, and you're going first might have picked up off the ground at 70 kilometers an hour then you're going first second but third before it comes back down with that drag the wheel stopped and you're coming back down on a slight angle and it's like you've got the brake on and the wheel stopped at the front is like you just had oil it goes and it's building up speed again but you're almost on the floor before it gets grip again you know the wheel speed matches the ground and goes pops back up and it's proper scary so that's why you're talking all the race teams have got expensive calipers you know and because those pistons um you can get replacement pistons um a couple of people are making titanium pistons for the stock brembo um calipers which are road calipers but obviously the pistons must swell or something these titanium ones don't they slide freer even at high temperatures so it's a cheaper way to uh, keep those stock calipers doing something you know but it's why the race teams keep their brakes they're washing them after every session as they don't want the drag they want them working freely you know the pistons and those seals with the no brake dust on and it stops causing that Catch-22 problem, more drag, more heat, more fade. So anyway, I hope that is of some help. My favourite race, that's a difficult one because uh, for any rider because you always have a lot of uh, rides that were the first time at something. For example, uh, the first time I knew the whole world superbike paddock noticed me, you know, I turned up as a wild card, that's what you want to call it, privateer, rode for Rumi Honda, and I qualified seventh, you know, and it was ahead of, I was on Fred Merkel's old bike for Rumi, and Fred was behind me on the grid, a higher number than seven, must have been eight or nine, and um, yeah, eight next to me, and uh, I'm on his old bike, you know, he'd gone riding for Yamaha for David Abrevio, and I really felt like Raymond Roche came up to me at breakfast and they're heroes of mine, you know, and I'm kind of... So there's memories like that that are dotted through your career as first time at something that you'll never forget. Um, but obviously this is my only win in the big class at Grand Prix, um, GPs, which is something special, you know. Uh, but 
it's still not my favourite race. And the reason is, um, I mean, I think part of it is I had to fly out straight after the race. I mean, I'm talking an hour after the race. I had to be quickly getting ready to jump in, believe it or not, helicopter with all the HRC boys to go to the eight hour. We went to Heathrow from Donington. Suzuki 8 hour. I remember sitting next to John Kaczynski um, on the flight to, and we got chatting until we fell asleep. And we had to be on the bike pretty much the next day, both of us, you know, testing for the eight hour. Um, so I didn't get to enjoy that win at Donington that day like normal, you know, um, taking the mechanics out for, for dinner and having a drink, etc. Uh, celebrating. The, but not only that, Phillip Island that same year where I got second um, is the winner of my career for favourite race because I'd like to explain why. It's Phillip Island. I love that track anyway. It um, has turns that are so intimidating, so scary fast that on a 500, trying to not get high-sided off it um, because there's, like I've mentioned earlier, got such light crankshafts, you're doing 200 kilometres an hour at or th through a turn and trying to keep control of it. And because it's so difficult, when you get it right, it's the most rewarding, you know. And uh, that on top of, um, I qualified reasonably well. It was, f I think, front row or just off front row. And... Um, First lap, I got a pretty average start in first lap, and seventh on the first lap. Mid race, I was seventh, and Mick had bolted, leading, and I managed to go through the field, passing my heroes. You know, heroes, and I'm not exaggerating. You'll know what I mean when I say, like there was, off the top of my head, Abe, um, Kaczynski, uh. Kriver was the last one I managed to get past. Sorry, Barros. Um, Kenny Roberts Jr., you know. Coming through, getting through those guys, picking them off one by one. Crivier was the last one. And then leaving them behind and bridging the gap halfway to Mick and finishing second to Mick at Phillip Island where the Aussie crowd, that's what they wanted to see. I was kind of the adopted um, Aussie, you know, being a Kiwi just across the water. Um, the crowd got to see... Mick win, me get second, like they wanted. The crowd went mental, like Mick had won the championship as well. And so I was standing next to my friend and hero doing with a bunch of heroes behind me, you know. And then the sea of people, like the all the Aussies that invaded the track, and uh, I'm already happy enough. And I look down and I get to see my grandparents, you know, from both sides, uh, uncle, uncles and aunties, and my parents looking up at me, how do you beat that? 